just like knowing some basics about how an operating system works or how memory or CPU work, knowing some basics about database internals will, especially a backend developer, will make you a more complete developer or engineer. And I believe it will boost your confidence as well. So let's see it. Hello guys, my name is Zinal. I'm a developer working on Kubernetes database operators as Percona. On this channel, we talk about Golang, Kubernetes databases, Vim, I don't know, general programming stuff. So if you like that, maybe consider subscribing. An application developer usually thinks about a database at its fundamental level, which is that a database needs to do two basic things. When you give it some data, it will store it like safely. And when you ask for that data, it will give it back. But we need to be aware, at least to some extent, uh, that there is much more to it. And choosing a database right or wrong can potentially have long term consequences. And if by chance the database you chose is not a good fit for your application, performance reasons, consistency issues, operational challenges, cost, it is not a trivial task to change it. And even though you might don't need to go deep into the subject, you at least need to choose a database for your particular application. And depending on the type of the workload you expect, you should be familiar, for example, that there are databases optimized for like transactional workloads and for analytical workloads. And if you miss that, for example, you will probably have some issues if your application gets slightly serious. And at some point, when your database needs some attention, and every slightly bigger application will need that at some point for sure, you need to be aware of like what is going on and knowing some basics about how a database work will definitely help you out. And still, if you like use a managed database, for example, I believe having this knowledge is still valuable, right? Because you know the internals, you know what is going on and you know if there is some like performance issues, you are aware of what potentially could be wrong. Okay, let's talk about it. The first thing that I want to distinguish here before moving on is the basic terminology. So when you say MySQL or Postgres, for example, those are not actually databases, but rather they are database management systems. A database is simply a collection of data, of information that is stored and can be retrieved. That is more or less it. But a database management system is everything around the database. So that is a query language. So the way you interact with your data, I don't know, security, replication, transactions, and everything else. But generally, we use those terms interchangeably. So when you say a database, you probably mean a database management system. And frankly, it is easier to say database rather than repeating database management system all over again. So when I say a database uh, in the video, I mean database management system. So when it comes to a database architecture, there is not like a blueprint for a database management system design, okay? Uh, every database is built slightly different and the boundaries uh, between different components and subsystems are blurred depending on the type of the database, uh, different consistency and uh, performance considerations, different architectural decisions and so on. So the architecture that I will present here is like what is generally common in these kinds of systems. So let's go. So when a request comes to a database, it will be handled by a transport subsystem. The requests will usually come in form of a query and they will be expressed by some query language, right? And they will land in client communication component. And like we see here, uh, the transport subsystem is also responsible for, for handling uh, inter-cluster communication. That is communication between different database nodes in a database cluster, okay? After the request is received, it will be passed to query processor. So something like this. Okay, the query parser will parse, interpret and validate the query. Here, usually access control and permission uh, checks are performed as well. After that, the query will go through a query optimizer. It will first remove all of the redundant uh, parts of the query and it will try to find most efficient way to execute it based on internal statistics that, that it calculates. The query is usually presented in a form of an execution plan or a query plan. And one query can be executed with like multiple execution plans. So query optimizer will choose the best available. We can also see uh, the, the execution plan that is, that is chosen by the, by the optimizer with like 
So for example, if you have a query, select, I don't know, star from users where ID equals 10. Okay, we can prepare this with explain keyword. And this will give us uh, a query plan that is selected by the query optimizer. Okay, MongoDB has also something similar. It has explain command, I think. Also, usually here we can find like a, a query cache, something like this. It will basically cache all of the select query results. And if it finds it, it will return it immediately and thus skipping everything else. Okay, the execution plan is then executed by a execution engine. So something like this. The execution engine will basically aggregate the results from uh, remote execution and local execution. Remote execution involves reading and writing data from a remote uh, different database node inside the database cluster. And this is where this cluster communi communication uh, component like, like fits in. So we have something like this, okay? And local queries are executed by the storage engine. Okay, so we have something like this. Cool. So when it comes to storage engine, we can like say that this is where the magic happens. This is the part of the database that is uh, responsible for managing how the data is stored and accessed both in memory and on disk. This is a core component and it is basically what makes a database fit to a certain category, okay? Like a storage engine will organize the data that it stores in like uh, relations or tables like uh, columns and rows or it can organize it in terms of uh, flexible documents. And because of that, we basically have like relational databases and document databases. So relational databases like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, right? And document databases like MongoDB, Cassandra, and so on. But the storage engine can also store the data in a row oriented fashion where all of the rows are stored, uh, are stored together on the disk or it can store it like in a column oriented fashion where all of the columns of a table are stored together on the disk. And from this, we have like columnar databases and row oriented databases. Columnar databases like ClickHouse, for example, and row oriented databases, we can say these are like traditional databases MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, and so on. Columnar databases are usually used for like analytical workloads, while row-oriented databases are usually used for transactional workloads. And besides this, a storage engine can, can, store, can store the data in memory or it can store it on the disk. So for that reason, we have like in memory databases and disk based databases. In memory databases like Redis, Hazelcast, and disk based databases like basically everything else. Like we see here, some basic components of a storage engine are transaction manager. This manager schedules transactions and it will ensure that uh, they cannot leave the database in a logically inconsistent state. Okay. The next one is lock manager. This manager locks on the database objects. Uh, for a running transaction, ensuring that concurrent operations do not vi violate uh, like physical data integrity, okay? Access methods, these manage access and organizing the data on the disk. Access methods in include heap files and different storage structures like B trees and so on. The buffer manager, even though SSDs are really, really fast today, but still RAM memory is orders of magnitude faster. So the buffer manager, also known as like buffer pool or buffer pool manager is basically like in memory cache of pages that are read from the disk. It is essentially like a large chunk of memory that is allocated inside of the database to store data pages that are fetched from the disk, right? And last but certainly not least is the recovery manager. A recovery manager 
uh, maintains the operation log and restores the system in case of a failure. This is primarily needed when there are changes that are made only in memory, like here in, inside the buffer pool, and when a failure occur, occurs before everything is flushed to the disk from the memory, we need a way to recover that state, right? Generally here, uh, we can find a append-only data structure that is that is always persistent on disk, and it is called uh, write-ahead log. So basically, whenever an operation comes in, like update or delete, it is first stored uh, to the write-ahead log, and this way, in case of a failure, we can reconstruct all of the changes that happened before the crash. What we also can say about storage engine is that some databases can have like a pluggable storage engine system in place, so you can basically swap storage engines. So for, for example, uh, MySQL and MongoDB can do that. So for MongoDB, you can choose two storage engines, like in-memory one that will store everything only uh, to memory, and the other one is disk-based, it is called uh, Wire Tiger, and it is the default one. And in MySQL, you can choose a bunch of different storage engines. And two most commonly used are InnoDB storage engine, that is a default one, and MyRox storage engine, which was first developed at, at, at Facebook. But for example, Postgres comes with only one storage engine, and that's it, you cannot change it. And the last thing about storage engines that I want to uh, just briefly mention, so we can be complete here, is that they are two families of storage engines. They are page-oriented storage engines and the log-structured storage engines. And this is a huge topic on its own. But uh, essentially, it is basically uh, two different ways of how the data is physically stored on the disk. And both of them have their like pros and cons. Uh, log-structured are generally preferred for like write-intensive workloads, while page-oriented uh, storage engines are like more balanced between writes and reads. So, okay guys, this was like some primary components and subsystems that like form a database management system. More or less, each of these components is like a topic on its own, but I hope I managed to give you like high level overview of what is going on, so we can at least appreciate a bit more what it takes to store our data like durably and correctly. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. I really hope this was uh, useful for you. If it was, maybe give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing so you don't miss content like this. And until the next video, take care and bye-bye.